That's what Seth just sang. The phrase that I love in that passage is, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. It's better to dwell at the threshold where God is than to enjoy everything that this world has to offer. And that really is the truth. And we've dealt with that some this week as we've looked at the importance of our relationship with the Lord and how that is the satisfaction. That's what we are built for. Okay, lest I have a revolt and an uprising, let me dismiss kiddos. Ages four years old to the third grade, by your leave, mom, dad, aunts, uncles, whoever brought you, whoever's in charge. You can follow out Miss Brittany in the back. <coughs> and they will head downstairs for their mighty competition and their class time. <laughs> With a little convincing. Uh, all right. Hey, and the rest of us, let's take our Bibles tonight. Turn with me, please, to the book of Philippians. We're going to be in this letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in a place called Philippi and learn some lessons from uh, the life and teaching of the Apostle Paul as he was instructed by the Holy Spirit of God, and I trust it will be a help to you tonight. Let me see it tonight. Um, how many of you are a little more tired tonight than you were last night? Let me see your hands. Okay, if you can't raise them, that means you're really a lot more tired than what you were last night. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for making the effort to come out. It's a little moot for me to say thanks. You don't do it for me. I understand that. But I'm glad that you're here. Because after having, over the last several months, preached to a camera um, for several weeks, if I never have to do that again, it'll be okay by me. It's a lot more fun to preach to people. Um, than it is to uh, preach to a camera. Though I will tell you that preaching to the um, elementary chapel the other day was a little more fun than preaching to you people yeah. because of the level of energy that they come into life with. Everything is exciting. With, with them, I, I came up, pastor introduced me, and I come up and I say, good morning, guys and girls. And they don't know who I am yet, so they just kind of sit there like, good morning. And so I tell them, my name is Mr. Tim, and when I say good morning to you, you're supposed to say, good morning, Mr. Tim, good and strong. So I say, good morning, guys and girls, and they say, good morning, Mr. Tim. And about three times later, I have to do it several times, and by the end of it, they're shouting with everything that's in them. I could try that till the cows come home, and it would never work with you people. There's no way. Good morning, men and women, and you'd just be sitting there looking at me. So uh, they're more fun, but I'm glad you're here anyway, all right? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, before we look at the passage tonight, let me uh, mention, because Pastor mentioned this last night about the book table that's in the back, and I told you I'd be telling you about some of the books, and as I said last night, only get it if it'll be a help to you, but if it will be a help to you, that's the reason why we carry the things that we carry. So let me mention three books, they look similar, just how they're laid out, but they each deal with different subject matter. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It's entitled Settled and Strong, subtitled What It Takes to Have Assurance of Salvation. This is a great book that just explains what the Bible has to say about living confident about salvation. I've had the privilege on a number of occasions to preach regarding what the scriptures say about living confident about salvation, and I am always um, I, I'm, I'm surprised maybe a little bit strong of a word, but it's interesting to me the age range of people that at times in their lives deal with doubts about am I saved, am I not, oh, did I really mean it, did I say the right thing, did I understand enough, did I repent enough, did I do enough to, uh, to really have salvation, and, and it's a hindrance to your being able to go forward in your Christian faith. And so this book, Settled and Strong, is a great resource for you to have. Um, or if you work with young people, again, this is another um, great one. Um, I, I was saved when I was four years of age. And so it probably doesn't surprise you that as I got a little bit older and began to understand a little bit more or would go through times in my life when I wasn't doing everything that I ought to do, that I would have this back and forth on the inside of me, man, I don't want to go to hell. Am I really saved? And I would struggle with that. And I struggled with it until the truth that is taught here was taught to me and uh, God really helped me with it. So um, this was written by an evangelist friend of mine who also dealt with that himself. So set him strong. And then here's one entitled, Be What You Are, Bible Principles for Gender, Roles, and Distinction. So this deals with kind of a hot button topic right now, um, namely male and female, and how God intended for that to work in marriage and in society. And uh, what I like about this book 
is that it's not mean-spirited. It just tells what the Bible says, but it's not mean-spirited, and we shouldn't be about it. But we do need something more solid than our opinions upon which to build our lives and to be able to speak to other people about it. If it ever comes up in a conversation, that is, gender, um, is it okay for men to marry men, or can men turn into women, or can women turn into men? And if that ever comes up in conversation, if you give your opinion about it, well, that's just as good as anybody else's opinion. But that's all it is. So you need something solid to build your life and your thoughts on. So this helps with that. Again, explaining what the scriptures have to say about it. And then this last one, tweets, posts, and pens. Scriptural guidance for social media. You may be um, surprised to find out that um, neither Facebook nor Twitter nor whatever pens has to do with um, <laughs> is in the Bible anywhere, but there is scripture guidance regarding um, things like social media and the time that it takes up and how much of ourselves we put out and how we portray ourselves. And so, again, each of these are small booklets, about 60 to 70 pages in length. And um, not a difficult read, but helpful, I'm convinced. And so we carry them with us. If any of those um, scratch an itch or tickle your fancy, then uh, stop by after the service and you can ask Seth about it and he'll be glad to help you. All right? Okay, we're in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look together at verse number 17. Now, if you're physically able, would you mind standing to show our public respect for the scriptures as we just read through this one verse, I'll pray, and then you can be seated. Philippians 3.17 says this, Brethren, be followers together of me. This is Paul speaking. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. And Father, I pray that you help us please to understand why this verse is in this passage and why it matters for our lives. Lord, help me please to teach what your word says here. Not my thoughts about it, but what you actually say. And then, Lord, would you please allow your spirit to take this truth and drive it into the hearts and minds and consciences of every person that is here. Lord Jesus, I'm trusting in your spirit to do in and through us what we cannot do by ourselves. I need your help. I confess it. Thank you, Father, for hearing our request, and I come to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. When God gave Brittany and I children, it was an eye-opening experience, <laughs> namely just how much work and effort goes into raising children. How many of you have children? Now, maybe they're grown and gone, or maybe they're still at home, but how many of you have children? May I see your hands, please? Okay. Is it not one of the most humbling things in the world, raising children? Before Brittany and I had kiddos, I think I mentioned this earlier this week, but Brittany and I prayed for six years or five years before God gave us Seth, and then it was five years later um, that God gave us biologically Samuel. Seth was via adoption. Samuel was our own, there is our own flesh and blood. And then two years later, um, Asher. And now four and a half, five and a half years later, we have another, we have another one coming. So um, before we had any children, I was an expert on raising kids. I really did have it figured out. And I could walk through Walmart and hear two aisles over the Walmart brat and think to myself, if I had that kid for five minutes, I'm telling you, everything would change, and it would change in a hurry. Now, the Bible does give instruction and help and can give us confidence in the raising of children and in the promises that he tells us. So all of that is true. I'm not making light of any of that. Only that there is some experience along with it that helps a bunch. Here's, here's what I came to the realization of. Um, the hardest part about raising my boys is that I have to raise myself out of them. It's like God gave them a double portion of everything that is bad about me. And, uh, or I could say me and my wife, my oldest son, Seth, we at home nicknamed him Seth the Hammer because Seth, well, I will tell you again, I, Seth is adopted into our family and it's like Seth came into our family saying, and we've had him ever since birth, 
But it was like he came into the family saying, Mom, Dad, how can I please you? What can I do? Seth was very quick to learn what we expected, and he was very easy to train. So that for the first six or eight months or the first couple of years of training children, I thought to myself, these other people just don't get it. I've got it figured out. They, they don't have it. But then his personality started to kick in a little bit more. And specifically when God gave us Samuel, then Seth began to have a little bit more responsibility. He's several years older, five years older than Samuel. So as Samuel came of age a little bit and we would leave Seth in charge for little bits of time. Seth is very much a rules person. And whatever the rules are, he is not only going to do the rules, but he's also going to implement the rules by whatever means necessary. Now, I will tell you, I will confess to you that I am by nature a little bit of a, uh, of a control freak. That is that um, I, I, I enjoy training children and I think it's important for when kiddos are told to do something that they do it immediately and they do it with a smile on their face and they say yes sir or yes ma'am when they do it and we make sure that that happens in our family and we make sure of that fairly consistently. Okay. So Seth, when he, <laughs> when Seth got that part of me, he got all of it plus. He's the hammer. If you don't do, that is when Seth is in charge, if the boys don't do what Seth says instantaneously, I mean just right now, then it is uh, no holds barred on what's going to happen. It has to be done. It has to be done right now to the point where I am going, Seth, have some mercy. <laughs> Show some patience. Easy, pal, easy. Okay, Samuel, um, Samuel is highly competitive. Highly competitive and very energetic. Now, when he wakes up in the morning, he doesn't come out with flying colors, but once the engine starts going, then it does not stop. And, and if we are ever in a competition about anything, then he is not, he's, he is, he, he does not want to lose, especially if it involves a girl. To lose to a girl is like the worst thing ever. And Samuel will be, play, will be playing football or something like that. And with just Seth and Samuel, the way we do it is dad and the quarterback, we kick off, they run down, and we do tackle football. So he comes running and you, and you tackle him. Well, if he starts losing or if he gets tackled or if he almost makes a touchdown but doesn't quite, his tendency is to go down on his knees and pound the ground and go, ah! And he, he gets that from his mother. I'm telling you, right? <laughs> She's not here to defend herself, so I can, I can try to pass that off as the truth. Oh, honestly, he got a double portion of everything that I am. I'm, I'm a, by nature a competitive person, and he got a double portion. Now, Asher is the one, is the one guy who's a little, bit, is a little bit different. Asher's head is in the clouds. His imagination is nonstop. Um, in fact... He'll be sitting here in church and uh, during even the song service, if there's announcements going on, something he's not actively participating, or even if he's supposed to be actively participating, I'll look over and Ash will have his hands like this and he'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know exactly what's going on, but in his brain, there's, there is a whole nother world. He has three or four imaginary friends. By, he knows them by name that come with us everywhere. In fact, sometimes it's, oh, please don't close the, close the door yet. David Crockett's mom is about to get in. And we have David Crockett and David Crockett's mom and we have Bongo a horse and we have all kinds of animals and people that come with us everywhere that we go. And uh, it's, it's really incredible. Now, in this case, that's neither Brittany nor myself. It's my younger brother. And it's terrible because I already lived through my younger brother once. I should not have to raise... <laughs> my younger brother, but that, that is what God has given to me. Okay, now here's, here's the reason why I mentioned this about my boys and the raising of them and the difficulty with raising them out of yourself, that is taking yourself out of them or helping them to know how to channel all of that, is that um, there are times with my boys that I get onto them for things that they do and I know full well that the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because of me. And maybe they're not doing it as uh, guarded as what I would do it. But they're just doing it full out. 
And so I think to myself, when I'm telling them, guys, don't do this, I'm thinking to myself, goodness, Tim, you are, you are the reason why they're doing it. And so what, in essence, I'm doing is I'm saying, do what I am telling you, but don't do exactly what you see me do. Now, that's not a good way to parent. That is, to say, do as I say, not as I do. We sometimes joke about it as parents. And in this case, we see ourselves in our children, but that's not a good way to raise a family. But it's interesting to me that in the verse that we read in Philippians 3, that the Apostle Paul doesn't have any of that kind of attitude at all about what he's dealing with. In fact, he tells the people to whom he's writing, listen, you guys follow me. Do what I'm doing. And other people who are doing like what I'm doing, people you have as in samples, you follow them, mark them and follow them, but follow Follow me. Here's what this teaches me. This shows to me that the Apostle Paul is not delivering to them via a letter, Philippians. He's not delivering them a letter or information or truth that he does not himself fully take on. In other words, he is fully convinced of what it is that he is telling them to the degree that he says, you all wholeheartedly and fully follow me. So then I have to ask myself, okay, what is he teaching them? Because he's passionate about this. In fact, when you read through Philippians 3, you can sense, if you read it uh, as it's intended to be read, you can sense the passion with which the Apostle Paul writes this letter and the information that he gives them. Now, we don't have time to set up all of the context, but if we start back in Philippians 3 and verse number, uh, well, let, let's, let's start in verse number 9. If we start in verse number 9, we see that the Apostle Paul, in continuing his statement, says that he wants to be found in Christ, found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, he says, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now here's where he starts to key in on what he wants them to follow him concerning. Verse 11. If by any means I might, I might, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Stop real quickly because there are some words and word order there that can be a little bit difficult to catch on just a quick run through or a read through rather. Basically what the Apostle Paul is telling these people about which he's so impassioned that he says, look, you do what I'm doing regarding this. He says to them, in essence, look, I am not going to live my life satisfied with where I am. I am trying to apprehend, grab a hold of that for which I am apprehended, meaning I am trying to live worthy of the resurrection. Now, he's not saying here that in order to gain the resurrection, in order to get to heaven, that he had to earn it. But he's saying that for which I have already been grabbed a hold of, apprehended, I'm trying to live for that, worthy of that. And then we get to verse number 13, which are familiar verses, and they're familiar for a reason. It's because they're good. He says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. And if, anything, uh, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me. Okay, so here is that passage in a nutshell. The Apostle Paul says, I will not live apathetically. I will not be satisfied with where I am. 
I am not going to live my life just okay with the status quo of how I have lived and how I am living. Now, he does say we're going to walk by the same rule. In other words, we're walking the same way. We're doing the same thing because we're continuing to do what's right. But he continues to say that I am going to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't know how big of a deal sports were back in the days when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. It seems to me, because of his references to sports as illustrations, that they must have been somewhat of a deal. We do know that he talks about wrestling or fighting. I don't fight as one that beat the air. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So that that would have been, we know this from history, that that would have been going on during these times in a competitive manner. But one of the greatest uh, athletic events that took place during this time were the races that people would have. And men would train for years and years to run these races. And Paul seems to draw illustration from these races. And what he says is basically this. Brethren, verse 13. I count not myself to have apprehended, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to forget things that are behind. I'm going to reach for things that are before. I'm going to press toward the mark, toward the end line toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. So here's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get the followers of Jesus Christ in Philippi to do. And by extension, because it's recorded for us, what he is calling us to is this. Listen. Be certain that you're moving forward Living for eternity. Amen. Be certain that you're moving forward, making progress, but making progress, living for eternity. When I, when I first started traveling and preaching, and, and I knew that God had called me into this ministry, I thought to myself, well, it shouldn't take real long to get, you know, to get everybody straightened out about life. Because all you have to do is remember that um, we're living for eternity and this world is just our passing through point and we're not supposed to live for the things of this world. We're supposed to live for forever and we're supposed to be continually progressing in this. But what I found out that you already know is that every day we are touched by the things of this world. We have stuff pushing against us, which is why the Apostle Paul says here that he's going to press toward the mark. Okay, let, let's just look real quickly at what he says, and we're not going to take long tonight, but this is so important. If there was some way for me to be able to put the heart that you see here into you regarding the importance of your living for eternity, friends, this would change absolutely everything in this church and in the ministry that you have around you. Because what an impact it makes when there is someone who becomes so heavenly minded that they actually are earthly good. Where we are so focused on that which is eternal that our lives become about that in every part. What the Apostle Paul claims here is this, that he forgot things that are behind. Now for him, he is talking about those things which he counted as valuable in his own life. If you were to read the portion of scripture right before the Apostle Paul makes these statements, he's talking about the fact that he's a, he's a Jewish man, that he is a religious Jewish man, that he was a Pharisee, which means he knew the law and knew it well and tried to live completely by the law. He was a student of the law, and he says all of those things which I considered to be valuable in the eyes of God, that I have what I could come and offer to God and say, God, look at what I am. This is what gives me value before you. The Apostle Paul says, I realized that all of those things I had to count as loss in order that I may win Christ. That is, Paul is saying, in order for me to reach toward the mark, to press toward the mark, I had to let go of things that were in my society considered to be valuable. Okay, now I'm going to guess that none of us would count our heritage or our great knowledge of the scriptures as the value of what we bring before God 
and say, God, this is what gives me value in your eyes or even in society around us. But friends, I will tell you, there is a sense in which we have to let go of the things that society considers to be valuable in order to be able to run the race. You can't hold on to the world and also press forward at the, at the same time. Amen. You're gonna, we are going to have to make a decision of what are we, what are you going to live for? Who, who is going to determine for you what is valuable? It can either be the world or it can be Christ, but it cannot be both. You cannot love God and money at the same time. It won't work. You can't live for the pleasures of this world and live for eternity. Now it is true that God can bless us and we can enjoy the things that God gives to us. But over and over in scripture and specifically through the apostle Paul, God reminds us, of the importance of laying aside any weight, laying aside anything that will stop us or hinder us or slow us down from living for eternity. Don't let the cares and loves and things of this world be what you live for. You and I both know the words of our Lord concerning this. The, the things of this world will have moth and rust, corrupts them, Thieves break through and steal, but we are to lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves cannot and will not break through and steal. And this is all well and good for us to raise our hand or shake our heads or say amen to. It's a horse of a different color for us to live out. That is for me to set aside the things in my life that have begun to grab at me. Like we looked at in, the chap in Matthew chapter 22 the other night about the importance of our relationship with God and making sure that it's God that we love. In our minds, we need to have a refocusing, a reviving on living for that which is eternal, on pressing toward the mark because there is coming a day when we will stand before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I desperately want to be able to hear him say, well done, Tim, good job, good and faithful servant. But that's not something that can or will happen on accident. It's something that is a decision where I say, I'm going to try to attain, to reach out, to apprehend that for which I have already been apprehended. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm going to live for his purposes, not for my own. How I do the things I do, what I do in my life, what I give value to in my life, all of that needs to center around Jesus Christ and eternity. The Apostle Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Hey, let me, make, let, let me make one more application about this. And I don't think that this is the primary, what I'm about to tell you, I don't think is the primary application of what the Apostle Paul is saying, but it is an application and it's supported in other places in Scripture. So let me, let me just mention it. Sometimes people have a hard time going forward for Christ and living for eternity not because they're not willing to let go of the world around them or the successes of the past, but sometimes it's a matter of past failures that stop you from being able to go forward. That is, you, you've blown it in some area. You've messed up. And anytime you even think about living for eternity, your thought is, well, I can't. I mean, I can't. I can't really be used. I, I mean, I'm, I've, I've lost my temper too many times. I messed up morally. I, I've made these mistakes. Okay, listen, listen, look. We're talking about God here. We're talking about God who can, like a potter, take marred clay and reform it, make it new, a vessel for use and for honor. And you can't let past failures stop you from serving God. When God says, if you confess, I'll forgive, he means it. He said, Brother Tim, I've tried that and I just don't feel forgiven. Okay, now hear me in context and I mean this kindly. 
Sometimes you've got to kick feelings to the curb and just take God at his word. Amen. And you have to make the positive declaration, not the question. The question is, am I clean? The positive declaration is, I am clean. And the positive declaration is the act of faith if it's a past failure that's been made right. And forgetting those things which are behind, and the Bible says, and reaching forth on the things that are before. That is, constantly moving forward. Okay, so here's, here's the deal. This is so, um, uh, this is a nutshell verse. This is a verse that like holds the whole idea of the entire passage in itself. So that the danger of it is, is that it gets preached, it gets said, it gets memorized, it gets understood, but it never gets, uh, if I use the term fleshed out, do you know what I mean by that? It never, it never works itself out in any way. But, but it's almost like God told the Apostle Paul something like that was going to happen. Look down at chapter 4, because in chapter 4, in the first several verses, basically, the, God gives to us, through the Apostle Paul, steps or areas of our life where we need to reach forth on the things that are before. Verse, or chapter 4, verse 1 starts off this way. Therefore, since all of this is true, since I'm going to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, therefore, follow me, brethren, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and my crown. Listen to this. So stand fast in the Lord my dearly beloved. He starts off by explaining how you're going to reach forward on things, to things that are before, and he begins by reminding you of your position and your relationship with Jesus Christ. And he encourages you, or calls us, rather, to this matter of standing fast in the Lord. I will tell you that what we dealt with when we looked at Matthew 22 and the importance of relationship with God is absolutely necessary if you're going to live for eternity. You can't step over a love for and a relation with God and with his son, Jesus Christ, and expect to ever be able to live for that which is eternal. So let me ask you, how is your, teenagers, how is your walk with God? And I don't mean how much of the Bible have you memorized or even how many chapters you read every day, but how is your relationship, sir, ma'am, how is your relationship with God? Stand fast in the Lord. This is how we reach forward on the things that are before. This is how we're going to press toward the mark. And the pressing toward the mark means that there's going to be obstacles and there's going to be difficulty in every day of your life. You need Jesus Christ and you need the work of the Holy Spirit and you need to have your faith built and you need to know what God has for you to do and you don't get that outside of a relationship with God. And I mean a live, vivacious relationship with God. So how's your relationship with God? Because you can have one. It's in Christ. It's not you. It's in Christ. And you can walk with the Lord. And you can know the peace and power that he gives. You can hear his voice. You can read his word. You can understand. You can be given step by steps. His word can be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. You can hide his words in your heart. And here, in encouraging these people, follow me. Here's where we're going. We're walking by this rule. This is the direction we're going. The steps forward, reaching forth under the things that are before. The first thing he mentions is stand fast to the Lord. And then he gets real, real practical. Um, verse number two. I beseech Eudeus and Syntyche, and I hope I pronounced that right, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, he talks to them about unity. He says, hey, look. Make sure, make sure that you center your life together around the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to walk through these. And verse 3, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, believers, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with others, my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. He encourages them to be givers, specifically to those um, who, are, who are about the business of sharing the, the word. I'm thinking specifically of missions, Hey, if, if you, if you want to step forward, I hope, I hope that you personally, each of you, invest in the spread of the gospel through giving to those who share it on foreign soil. You need, you need to be involved in that. We say, but Tim, I don't have much. Okay, you may not have a lot. And I'm not here to stand and tell you how much you ought to give. 
by percentage or by amount. But here's what I will tell you. If you're going to reach forward under those things which are before, what he says is, make sure you're helping people who have been co-laborers with me. This is Paul speaking. Those who've been co-laborers with me, you make sure you help them. Take, take care of them. Those who would be doing that kind of work. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice we may deal with this later on in the week, so I won't spend time there. But just have, having a rejoicing heart. Verse 5, let your moderation, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Connected with that. Don't be worried about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The idea is don't live in a, in a, uh, in a worldly big way. The phrase that comes to my mind, but I don't want you to laugh at me, is don't live with bling. That is, don't, don't, don't live trying to portray yourself as having much. Let your moderation, let your temperance be known unto all men. That is, live with what you need. Be content with such things as you have. If God blesses you with more, fine, enjoy. Nothing wrong with having a nice house or a nice car. Uh, if God gives it to you, but that's not what you're, that's not what you're portraying. That's not what you're living for. Let your request be made known unto God. Verse eight then finishes up where he says, and find the brethren, what sort of things are true, honest, just, uh, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, then think on these things. He's talking about your inner life. That is in your mind about how to live victorious. All of these things are just ways that we're reaching forth on the things that are before this, this, this is the way Paul was walking. And he was saying to the brethren, hey, follow me in this. We're living for eternity and this is the way. This is, this is how we're going to walk through it. When, when I was in the fifth grade, we lived in Iowa. My family did. And we lived, uh, if you're familiar, because it's, only, it's not real far away, it's between Fairfield and Mount Pleasant. And we lived in a little place called the Round Prairie. Uh, basically, we lived on a gravel road that was 17 miles from any town that had anything of any size. We lived out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded on all sides by either corn or beans, depending on what year we were in. Um, and hundreds upon thousands of grasshoppers. That's just, that's just um, who our neighbors were. Now, about a mile away from us, we had some friends that lived. Again, I was in fifth grade. And we homeschooled and they homeschooled. And since that was the case, we would get done with school, you know, one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And then basically we would ask mom and dad, hey, can we go play with our friends? They said yes. But in order to get there, we would have to either walk, no good, or else ride our bikes. So um, basically where, where, where we lived, again, on gravel roads, um, in order to get to our friend's house, you would go about um, 150 yards on flat road, and then the hills would start, the Iowa hills, and you'd go down up a small hill, down a little deeper, up a little bit larger hill, down one more time up what was, to me back then, a huge hill, and then down and up into our uh, friend's place of residence. So when we would go to our friend's house, my brother Paul would jump on his bike, I'd get on my bike, and it was one of these three speed bikes. It was not cool at all. It was very much... Uh, well, in fact, it was green. It looked, it looked a lot like the Wicked Witch of the West bike, um, <laughs> complete with the bell, ring, ring, that we, would, that we would ride. So I take off from my house, and I go down the gravel road, I go down the first hill, and I failed to mention that at this time in my life, well, I was in the fifth grade, and I have had the same waist size ever since the fifth grade. I was a fairly portly child. I was about as wide as I was tall, so exercise was not in my favor. So we would get going down this straight away, go down the first hill, up the small hill. Going down was great. I had a low center of gravity. I could get all kinds of speed going down. Go up the first little hill, go down the next one, make it up about three quarters of the way up the hill, but I could push through, go down the last hill and up the last big hill, and about halfway up, I, I had all I could have. I had the gear as high as it could go. You know, I'm going like this and my wheels are just barely turning and about halfway, three quarters of the way up, I, was, I wasn't going to make it. But here's what I found out. I found out that if I would get little goals in front of me, 
that I could make it to the little goals and then I'd set another little goal and another little goal and eventually I would find myself making it. If I looked at the top of the hill, it wasn't gonna happen. But little goal after little goal after little goal would eventually get me to where it was I was shooting for. So I'm on a gravel road, so the most natural little goal to choose was a rock. So I would look up about 10 feet ahead of me, find a rock, pedal to the rock. As soon as I get to the rock, look up, find another rock, pedal to the rock, look at another rock, pedal to the rock, look at another rock, and then crest the hill and down and make it. All right, so, so it taught me the lesson that the Apostle Paul is teaching here. Look, what we're living for is for eternity. What we're living for is to hear our Lord and Savior say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. But in our lives, there are these reaching forth unto things that are right in front of us. These steps of obedience and steps of faith where I begin to add into my life the importance of being steadfast in my walk with God and unity around the Lord Jesus Christ and beginning to give and to make sure that I am purposely rejoicing in the Lord in every way and that I'm not living for the things of this world, but I come to God and ask Him for my needs to be met. And I think on things that are right and good and pure. And as I reach towards these things, I find that I have been continuing on in the way that God had for me all the time. So that at some point, I do get to hear my Savior say, well done. And friends, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So, Calvary Baptist, run the race till we see Christ. I count not myself to have apprehended, but here's what I'm going to do. Forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press toward the mark the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And may God help us to stay focused on living for eternity. Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I ask you please to take this truth that your servant Paul was so passionate about so that he was willing to say, hey, follow me, be like me. Father, take this passion, please, and put it into the hearts of every child of yours that is in this room who is willing to say, yes, Lord, that's what I want, that's what I need, and anything else, let me forget about it. And let me press toward the mark. Any of your children, dear Father, who come to you tonight asking, please put it in them. Help us to, by faith, walk by the same rule, live by the same mind, to continue to press, always letting go of those things that would pull against us from following you the way that we ought to. And then, dear God, would you please use those who will live for eternity? Please use them for eternity. Let us have impact in the community around us that's eternal impact. 
And I ask this, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, tonight we see what the passage here says, what the heart and passion of the Apostle Paul is. And in reality, it's actually just a revealing of what God's desire for us is because he spake as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance. So I wonder how many tonight would say by an upraised hand and in your heart and perhaps in a moment with your mouth to God, you would say, this is what I want. This is what I need. I see steps that need to happen. I see some things that need to be let go of. I see some, um, some forward movement that needs to happen. I want to live with this same heart, with this same passion. I cannot say, Brother Tim, that I am currently living for eternity or that I'm consistent in it, but tonight I see its value. I see, its, I, I see that this is what God wants for us, and this is what I desire. And you'd say by an uplifted hand, Brother Tim, please pray for me and with me that tonight would be a turning point in regards to this. If that's true for you, would you slip up your hand where you sit and say, Brother Tim, please pray with me and for me about it. Okay, a number of hands. God bless you. I will pray for you. I will pray for you in just a minute, and I'm going to encourage you to pray for yourself. Let me just ask, as, as a testimony of God's grace in your life, how many of you would say, Brother Tim, this is something God has already dealt in my heart about before, and to the best of my knowledge, this is not arrogance, but to the best of my knowledge, by God's grace and with God's help, I am living for eternity. This has already been my desire, and as far as I know, um, and, and again, with God's help, this is where I'm currently living. If that's true, it's a testimony of God's grace in your life, and you're already having learned this. Would you slip up your hand? And uh, yeah, well, wonderful. Good. God bless you. Great. Great. My friend, if you're in neither one of those groups, if you're not currently living focused on eternity, but you're not desiring to live for eternity, then again, this is not an arm twist, but just, I must let you know. What you are saying is, I am going to live for this world, and I know it. I'm going to live for here and now, and to think, well, I'll give God Sundays. I mean, I'm not like letting go of God completely. I'm just not going to live for eternity. Oh, friend, what you're doing is setting aside what God has for you in order to take on something that is so much, it's so inferior. Let me encourage you to just consider making the decision to live for eternity. Let me pray for us tonight. I'm going to pray for those that have raised their hands in regards to this decision. And then I'm going to give just a few moments. The pianist is going to play through a song of invitation. And I'm going to invite you to seal with God that which he's dealt with you concerning. That is, just nail it down. Nail it down. The decision, the desire, talk to God about it, and then pastor will come and close the service as he sees fit. Father, would you please hear the prayers of your children as they come before you? We need you. We know it. We, we rest in the risen Christ for the power to live for eternity. He, our great example, and he, our strength to be able to live focused on eternity. We call on you to accomplish in and through us what there's no way we could ever do in the flesh living for eternity. We need you and we know it. So please, dear God, please hear the prayers of your children as we come humbly before you, asking you for the grace to live with eternal eyes, with a heart that seeks and yearns for that which is eternal. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask this on behalf of all who will now come before you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, the pianist begins to play.